All right, everyone, welcome back to the Tourism Naturally Conference. I hope you all enjoyed the short break we got. Um, now I will be passing over uh, the mic to Catherine Metzger, who is with Human Dimensions of Natural Resources at Colorado State University to introduce our next session. Catherine. Great, thank you, Emily. Um, welcome everyone, and thank you for attending this session. I do just want to note at the end, there will be time for Q&A. During that time, please use the Q&A function rather than the chat. Now I have the honor of introducing Mr. David Bugs, the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, an agency of the state of Texas. His role includes developing and managing the execution of their agency's diversity and inclusion strategy. He is also the former Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for FedEx Office, Inc. He is an accomplished cultural compliance and management professional with years of experience in the areas of relationship building, leadership development, mentoring, training, and executive coaching. David also provides insight on behavior management, cultural understanding, multi-generational management, and ethical and government compliance. Mr. Bugs has shown commitment to and is committed to many boards and professional memberships. For the sake of time, I will just name a few. The Texas Audubon Society, Minorities and Natural Resource Conservation, Conservation, Diversity and Inclusion Joint Venture, and National Conservation Leadership Institute. Mr. Bugs received a BS in marketing from Southern University. He continued his education with an MBA in marketing from Baylor University. Then he completed the Executive Development Program at University of Texas, Austin. David, welcome. Well, good afternoon to everyone, and I'm glad to be here. I am uh, calling you from Chile, Charleston, West Virginia, where I'm also attending another conference. And I was uh, sharing with uh, Catherine a little earlier, sometimes when you have three or four presentations, uh, you get some stuff mixed up in your head. But hopefully, I am clear and concise of what I'm going to share with you all today. So let me do this. Let me go to my screen and start sharing. So I titled this a little differently, uh, and this is a title that I, I use quite often, Different Shades in Green. And, and you'll find out what I'm talking about with that. It's kind of obvious, but as a diversity and inclusion guy, uh, you kind of get the gist of where I'm going with that. Now, I put this slide in here just as kind of a filler slide, just tell you a little bit uh, more about uh, uh, what I'm doing. I've been working with a lot of different organizations to talk about how we create more inclusion in the outdoors, not just only from a recreational standpoint, but also from a conservation career standpoint. So we're going to get into a little bit of that. But there was a, a, a situation recently that I, I thought about where I introduced this guy to some folks. Now, some of you all may know who he is, Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie uh, is a folk singer. He was uh, really big back in the 40s and 50s, but he wrote a song uh, that everybody knows, and it's called This Land is Your Land, This Land is My Land, and you probably know the rest of it. We all learned it when we were in elementary school. Uh, so I went to this group not long ago that was having issues with engaging folks from a broader audiences, from diverse audiences. And I actually had them to start off by singing, this land is your land. And the last verse of that song says, this land was made for you and me. And I stopped and I asked the question, when I look around the audience, do you see you and me, or is it just you? And if you only see you, how do we change that? So the Outdoor Foundation shared a statement not long ago, 
And this is a statement, and I'm not going to read all of it, but it basically says, uh, as our demographics change and the majority of our population becomes uh, more and more what we call minorities, uh, which is kind of oxymoron with minority, majority, minority. Uh, we got to do a better job of engaging everybody in outdoor recreation. Actually, they said it was critical. A guy that I've developed a relationship uh, with by the name of Dr. Drew Langham, and some of you all may know him, he's at Clemson University. He said this, he says, with the numbers so clearly showing the trends to come, uh, there is no question that we need to do a better job of engaging black and brown faces in America's wild places. It's a question of survival. Not doing such is uh, unsustainable. It's selfish and very short-sighted. So. One of the things we've got to think about when we start talking about outdoor engagement is whether or not it's relevant to the society that you're serving. And if it isn't relevant to that society that you're serving, we risk the support of the society, of the, uh, the, 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 the habitats that we all love and that we all appreciate and that we'd like to recreate in. So just a quick overview, and I'm not going to read all of this, but one of the things that I've recognized in doing this work, and I've only been doing this work about nine years, but I've had an opportunity to get out and touch and talk with a lot of folks across the U.S., whether it's state government, NGOs, federal government, we've done a fairly decent job of conserving our natural resources across the U.S. and preserving some of those natural spaces for people to go out and engage uh, but our population has changed. It's changing drastically, even as we speak. And most of the things that we're still focused on cater to a population that is doesn't look like this fast-growing majority population. It doesn't go into the neighborhoods of those different groups. It's not appealing to them at all. It's, it's focused mostly on a majority white and mostly male demographic. So we've got to do a better job of promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion to engage this growing audience. So again, that word relevancy is going to become a huge issue for us. And in some aspects, it has become a huge issue for us. So again, I, I, I want to put these numbers out there because not everybody's really sure about that. So I, I just want to emphasize that our, 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 our population is changing. And in some places it has changed. I'll just tell you for a fact, in the state of Texas, we've been, uh, again, that oxymoron majority minority for over 15 years, and it's still growing. We've also been predominantly female. We're 52% female, but still a lot of the things that we do when it comes to outdoor activities, catering to the outdoors, even conservation careers, is still focused majority on white and male. Something else that I thought was very interesting, when we start looking at the generations that are coming behind my generations, the millennials and the Gen Zs, they're already majority diverse. Another thing that I thought was very interesting, and I found this recently, I did a presentation to a group in the Northeast, and it was the fact that the white population is actually shrinking. Now, if our objective is to preserve these natural areas, these habitats, uh, preserve these different schemes and different uh, uh, areas for people to go out, recreate, to enjoy, and also to preserve, but the group that's focused on preserving those, or those uh, different areas is shrinking, we've got a problem. And we've got a problem we've got to address real soon. Uh, it's going to be a problem for everybody. Now, one of the other things that I do, I do a lot of recruitment opportunities. Even uh, while I'm here in Charleston, we brought in a group of students from different organizations, predominantly minority and female students, to talk about natural resource conservation, uh, to talk about uh, natural habitats and how we need to preserve those different habitats. And we have seen some growth in women and minority students majoring in different fields around natural resources and agriculture. And it's actually, again, it's actually growing percentage-wise faster than uh, the predominantly white population. Also, when we start looking at 
uh, who's majoring in these natural resource careers is predominantly females. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things I was just blown away by, even when it comes to the graduate level, the preponderance of the folks that are getting those PhDs and master's degrees are females. Now, the thing that we're focused on is we've got something in uh, federal government, and I think uh, Toby, uh, who spoke a little earlier, would attest to this. We're running into something called a silver tsunami, which means a lot of the folks that have been in those organizations for years and years are starting to retire or they're nearing retirement. Actually, at our organization, next year, for the next five years, about 35 to 40 percent of our folks will be eligible to retire. And we haven't done a really good job of replacing them, although I'm working on that. But we've got to get more folks interested and get them in the doors to these different careers in natural resource conservation and also outdoor recreation. But when we look at the information, which was collected by Dr. Dorsetta Taylor, uh, she's no longer at the University of Michigan. Now she's at Yale School of Forestry. It still says the preponderance of folks that are in leadership and doing this work don't look like that growing population. So we've got to fix that. Something else that's at stake is fish and wildlife conservation and engaging in fish, uh, fishing and hunting. As a matter of fact, when we start talking about fishing and hunting, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. I, I think something else that Toby mentioned earlier is when we look at these conservation agencies, especially those that support habitat for fishing and hunting, it is recreation. And it's a multi-billion dollar recreation industry. And we get dollars from duck stamps, uh, from license fees and all of that, but we also get dollars from sales of outdoor equipment to support some of these landscapes. But if you've got folks that are not doing it anymore, and we've seen a decline, especially in hunters, uh, it's going to hurt that industry and it's gonna translate into folks not wanting to go outdoors and also uh, translate into habitat that's not gonna be kept or, or focused on like it used to be. So the thing that we've gotta do is figure out how to make what we do, this, this natural resource in these outdoor areas relevant to this growing and changing population. And here's the caveat, without losing the current participants and supporters, we all started in some type of agrarian background. I mean, but if you look at the data from the early uh, 1900s, the majority of the folks that are in the US, the vast majority were in some kind of sub sub suburban or rural setting. Uh, we farmed, we fished, we hunted, we did all these things in the outdoors and we had a strong appreciation for the outdoors. And that was everyone, not just certain groups. But what started happening in the 40s all the way through the 70s, folks start migrating, uh, people of color especially, start migrating to cities because of different things that were happening. Land was being taken or sold. Or they weren't able to manage it without getting loans and so on and so forth. And they needed to support their families. So they started moving to uh, more urban areas. But one of the things we also recognize, even though this demographic moved to those more urban areas, there was still an intrinsic appreciation for nature and outdoors in them. It, I had an opportunity recently to go visit some family in the Brooklyn, New York area. And one of the things that just struck me is when you go around the city, every lot that was a vacant lot has been turned into some kind of cityscape. And the people that are taking care of these cityscapes are the folks in the neighborhoods. It's fascinating to me. And you'll find out if you go to a lot of major cities, especially to some of those uh, what we call underserved areas, you'll still see these cityscapes. So these areas where folks have, have developed some kind of a neighborhood garden or, or some kind of neighborhood flower uh, area or something like that, because it's in all of us to have that appreciation for the outdoors. And one of the things that we know about being in the outdoors, there are some serious health benefits. 
the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation said these are some of those. They did a study and they found out these are some of those. It boosts the immune system, it lowers blood pressure, it reduces stress. And we all know that even if we're really upset about something, if we just go outside for a while, take a walk or a stroll in the woods or around the lake, or just sit on a bench and look at a pond for a while, it reduces our stress. It affects our mood. It helps us to think clearly. It also helps our energy level. So all of those things are health benefits, but not only are there health benefits, they're academic benefits from engaging in nature. I'm on the board for the Texas Children in Nature, and one of the studies that was done by National Children in Nature said that young people, children that are engaged in the outdoors uh, from an early age have better academic performance, they have enhanced attention spans, they have increased enthusiasm and engagement in the classroom, and they also have better behavior. And from seeing that, I wished I would put my kids in the outdoors a, a lot more when they were younger, but I'm not going to go there right now. There is a false belief, and I hear this all the time, that, well, yeah, Mr. Bugs, we want to get more people of color engaged in the outdoors, but, you know, they don't really have an appreciation for it. And I want to let you know that's not true. There was a, a, a poll, an exit poll that was done in the state of California a few years ago, and it asked about increasing funding for conservation efforts and developing recreational venues. And over 90% over 90 percent of the ethnically diverse population were vastly in favor of it, even though they may not go and take advantage of it. So if that doesn't say that there's appreciation for it, I don't know what does if you're willing to put your money behind it. So there was a study done that some of you all may be familiar with by the uh, the, uh, I, I can't remember the name of the organization, but it was called the uh, Nature of America Survey. Uh, and, and actually, you can go out on uh, the internet and, and Google Nature of America's survey, and it'll give you all kinds of data on how folks look at the outdoors. But one of the things they found out that regardless of ethnicity, all people had an appreciation for the outdoors. And one of the things I always share with folks, we may not all have the same kind of hunting heritage or, or maybe even fishing, although fishing is still pretty popular across demographics, but everybody has a connection in nature. Now, North Carolina State University Natural Science Department did some research recently, and, and I thought it was very important to share a little bit of this, because there is some information that came from that study and also from the Nature of American study that says there is a concern when it comes to the ethnic population, a diverse population engaging in nature-based outdoor recreation activity based on some historical demigration, uh, uh, discrimination. And, and, and I will tell you, even in our great state where we have a lot of our state parks, we have uh, almost uh, 89 state parks. We, we actually in the process of developing more. There was some historical discrimination even though they were built by the CCCs and included in those CCCs organization, the conservation uh, corps, there were people of color. But there was some discrimination even with them building them in some of the areas. And as you can see on these pictures, when they took the pictures, all those that were deemed white and even some of those that were deemed Hispanic were mixed in with the white, but those that were African American were segregated. So what the CCC did eventually, because they saw that everybody needed an opportunity to uh, do this work and send money home to their families, they started developing corps that were exclusive or troops that were exclusively African-American or exclusively uh, Hispanic or exclusively Asian to build some of these areas. But here's a problem. After they built these areas, after they had blood, sweat, and tears going into developing these parks. And this is not just in Texas. This is across the US. Many of them weren't allowed to go back to them. So like I said earlier, history develops perspectives. So when you see this kind of thing, when your family comes along and your grandkids come along, 
the thing that you tell them is, well, these places aren't for us. So we've got to flip that script. We've got to change that scenario. Some more from, uh, interesting information that came out of the Nature of America study. It talked about safety in these areas. Uh, a lot of times, people of color don't feel safe. I can remember a video that I saw a number of years ago uh, by the actor Blair Underwood, uh, where he was actually jogging in a park. And people kept popping up and asking him, uh, why was he there? Uh, was he lost? Uh, and it was white people that were normally in the park that were approaching it. Well, after you do that a few times and people keep popping up and asking you, why are you here and are you lost? That creates some concern. Now, a recent concern that we all saw was uh, Christian Cooper, who was bird watching in the park. And, and just asking someone about uh, putting a dog on the lease created a situation where he actually had to uh, be concerned for his life because someone is accusing him of doing something that he didn't engage in. So safety is a big issue. And historically, there are some other issues that have come around safety for people of color in uh, these public spaces. So that was one concern. Another one was perceived cost. Because when you see a lot of the advertisements for engaging the outdoors and in these natural spaces, uh, you've got folks, first of all, that don't necessarily look like you. And there's a big mantra out there that says, if I don't see me, it won't be me. But there's this perceived cost that you've got to have a pair of $500 hiking boots. You've got to get a $400 backpack. And you've got to have a kayak that has uh, two seats and these brand new oars and all these other things that go along with that. And, and this is the perception that's pushed out to the general population. Well, when you see that sort of thing and you either don't have that uh, income to buy those things or you've got to make different decisions about whether or not uh, you want to spend that income for that, it causes you to pause before you engage in that activity. So we've got to do a better job of saying these things are for everybody and the cost can be as minimal as you want it to be. You don't have to spend all this money on all these different articles in order to participate. Another big thing is access. And my organization is actually trying to figure out how we can create more public land that's close to uh, urban areas. So folks don't have to travel uh, 50 and 60 and 70 miles to get to natural places to go out and to hike or to to do a respite or something like that. And, and actually, uh, one of the things that we're starting to find out is the perception of what we have as the outdoors is a little different from that of folks that are in urban areas. Because a lot of times when we think of the outdoors, we have a very European mindset. We think the outdoors is way over there or way out there. When the actual uh, thing about the outdoors is it's wherever you are. So we've got to do a better job of teaching folks how to engage in nature wherever they are, right there in their backyard. There's nature there. So we've got to have those kind of conversations. And we also have to recognize that we are competing for other things that are very important in other folks' lives. And we're not only competing for their time, we're also competing for uh, some of their income. So if they got this discretionary uh, amount of money and they've got to make a decision of where they're going to go, they're going to go to that place that they're most comfortable. So are we making the places where we are comfortable? Now, this was something that I, I thought was very important to share, and I'm not going to read all of it again, uh, but this was a quote from uh, Dr. Manuel Pastor at uh, USC. He says, unless we get young people and the family engaged in the outdoors and parks right now, we will not have the political support we need uh, to keep these things going. And, and I will share, there is a bill that some of you are maybe for, familiar with. It's called the Recovering America Wildlife. And we've been trying to get this thing passed for a number of years, over 10 years. And what that bill would do was supply money to the states so they can continue to build out and support habitat 
for non-consumptive use because we've all recognized that we have more people that are doing wildlife viewing now than they are hunting and fishing but we've got to have some funds to support those particular habitats so folks can continue to go out do wildlife viewing and, and instead of just hunting and fishing now we're not saying stop hunting and fishing be mindful of that but as the public grows, and we saw a lot of this during the pandemic, people were actually starting to get outdoors and just just view the outdoors, viewing the trees and the landscapes, looking at flora and fauna. But if we don't have dollars to continue to support that, we're going to be in trouble. So we've got to do a better job of getting folks engaged in the outdoors, especially this growing demographic, or we're all going to suffer. Now, something else that I thought was very important to talk about that came out of the uh, NC State study was more inclusion in careers, not only in conservation, but in recreational organizations can help increase diversity within the outdoors. Getting folks out in, into leadership positions in, in, in uh, outdoor recreation agencies and, and getting them on advisory boards. So uh, they can share their perspective of what it means to be outdoors and engage in the outdoors or have different activities in the outdoors is huge. So how do we get started with some of that? Well, let's talk about these careers and the engagement on these boards and all of that kind of stuff. The first thing we have to recognize is not everybody has the same view of conservation. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I started doing this work, when I heard the word conservation, you know, I was thinking, well, the, the blue trash can or the green, green trash can, you know, which do I put what in? But conservation is broader than that. We're talking about sustainability of habitats, sustainability of landscapes, creating a habitat where flora and fauna can flourish. But that's what conservation is. But not everybody has that same understanding. And I'm finding out even going around and talking with college students, when I talk about conservation, they don't have a clue. Even some of those that are in natural resources don't really get the concept or the American concept of conservation. So we've got to make sure that we're explaining that to our students as they come along and putting information about natural resource careers and and getting engaged in some of these uh, uh, different recreational careers, Lord, where you, you, you're teaching folks about uh, the outdoors and, and being interpreters for different areas. But we also got to, especially in the minority community, we've got to make sure that parents are engaged in this. We can't just go out and take a group of kids outdoors and then take them back and think all is well. Now they're going to be hooked. If the parents aren't engaged, kids can't continue to be engaged. We've got to create some mentoring uh, programs and some internship programs so folks have opportunities to go out, actually touch, get engaged with developing of different habitats and, and understanding how to explain the value of these different habitats to folks that are coming out and viewing and enjoying outdoors. We've got to make sure that we get folks on some of these boards for these different organizations that are supporting these different habitats and these natural areas and the recreational areas, because not everybody sees the outdoor recreation the same. So we've got to make sure that everybody's view is included in it. Otherwise, why would I want to get engaged in something that uh, doesn't cater to some of the things I enjoy doing in the outdoors? So here's some uh, keys to increasing participation. We've got to address history. We know there's some history out there that we've got to be open and honest about. I think someone said on the previous uh, panel that we've got to be authentic about, you know, who we are and what happened in these areas, but still make it inviting. We've got to create more access, like I was talking about earlier, making sure we develop spaces that are closer to urban areas. We've got to also look at the images and messages that we're sending. Uh, if I see something and there's nobody on there that looks remotely like me, I don't know if that's something I want to engage in. We got to also recognize that we've got to make sure that people have choices. We can't all uh, say folks need to go and just hunt or just fish or just hike. We've got to make sure that people know about different choices. We also have got to stop doing these passive actions where we just go off and do a one off trying to engage diverse audiences. We've got to be intentional. We've got to be consistent. We've got to find out what it is that they want to do, how they want to engage and not lay upon them our story. There's an old uh, uh, African uh, proverb that says, you have to be careful about 
uh, the lion telling the zebra story. We got to go out and find out what their stories are and help them to understand how to relate differently. And we've got to relate to them differently. We've got to develop some volunteer opportunities as well so they can get out and engage and see themselves in the outdoors and get other folks to see them volunteering out there so they can feel like this is a place where they, they belong. A good friend of mine by the name of Mickey Fern used to be the Deputy Director of the National Park Service said something I thought was profound. He says, recreational programs and services more than any other public service is a reflection of the values, attitudes, experience, and cultures of those who plan them. So if you weren't a part of the planning, why would you want to be engaged in it? If you weren't considered in how things were developed, why would you want to be engaged in it? Uh, Ruth Benedict, uh, who is an American anthropologist, said that culture is the biggest thing that causes issues and distinguishes differences between people. So we've got to examine our culture. We've got to recognize we play a part in influencing our culture. And we've got to learn how to be culturally agile. Now, here's some of the things, and I'm going to throw this by real quick, that we can do to be more culturally agile. We've got to be comfortable being uncomfortable, get in situations where we're not necessarily comfortable. But that's how you renovate things. You got to tear some things down. You got to break some things first before you fix it the way where everybody can enjoy it. You got to be honest because we all have biases towards things that we enjoy in the outdoors and how we like to enjoy it. But not everybody uh, thinks and sees and have engaged in things the same way that we do. We got to remain curious. We got to be intentional again when we engage these different audiences not just do one-offs or drive-by uh, engagements and we got to be champions for change and we got to be authentic and recognize it's not a zero-sum game where we, if we invite all these different diverse audiences out there then i lose something no we all get because now we have perspectives that are different from ours but we also have other hands that can help us support the habitat we've got to learn how to listen and include, and that's very important. Uh, one of the things we started doing in our uh, urban wildlife department in uh, my organization is we started doing something called urban listening tours, actually going out to different neighborhoods and asking questions instead of telling folks how to engage in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to make folks feel like they belong. And that's very important when it comes to outdoor tourism. People have to feel like they're, they belong regardless of their backgrounds, regardless of their abilities or disabilities, they got to feel like they belong. But it also requires us having conversations with them and creating uh, ways for them to engage in the outdoors without being too encumbered. So when we start talking about belonging, I actually had this slide because I did a teaching session to talk about what belonging means. But belonging means feeling like you're a part of something feeling like that you also have some say in developing whatever that is and feeling like this is something I encourage you to go and try to recruit folks and get uh, them engaged in some of the things that you're doing and then engage yourself in some of the things that they're already doing and get engaged in programming that is close to where people already live. Uh, we can't pull folks way out in the woods and expect them to have an appreciation. They need to be in a space where they feel safe and they feel comfortable. Again, recruit volunteers and interpreters from these different demographic groups. Um, and one of the things that we started doing is actually going to historically black universities, Hispanic serving institutes, all these different universities, the MSIs, and, and asking folks to volunteer and then teaching them how to do different activities so they can in turn teach other folks to uh, do those different activities in the outdoors, whether it's kayaking. And you can see some, some folks we're training on how to uh, teach other folks on how to kayak, but it increases your volunteer, it increases diversity. It helps them understand uh, what conservation means. And it also helps uh, develop some uh, talent so folks can look at careers in conservation. Again, got to make sure that all of the things that you have as far as uh, media is concerned and images, they're inclusive. Uh, your social media is inclusive. Uh, and, and make sure that it's not just a conversation. 
there's actual activity that's going along with some of these conversations you have about inclusion. Uh, Carolyn Finney said something that I thought was great. Not everybody has the same outdoor story. Not everybody engages in the outdoor uh, the same way. It's a universal story. But we've got to make sure that we examine our own biases about what we would like to do in the outdoors and understand do you want to be comfortable or do you want to be better? So I'm just about done. I, I put this sign in here. It was actually a, a, a frame panel that I saw in a thrift store. And it says, if it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. And I think this is very important for us to remember. Uh, and we've got to have a plan. We've got to make sure that what we're doing is important to the mission. We've got to make sure that we're inclusive in everything we do. And we've got to stop doing some things. And we've got to make sure that uh, we, if we need help engaging these different audiences, that we get help. And lastly, we got to make sure everybody feels like they belong. If they don't feel like they belong when they come and, and engage in these outdoor activities, uh, they're not going to stay. They're going to leave. And with that, I am done. Let's see if anyone has any questions. I know that was fast. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, let's see, do we have any questions in the Q&A? Uh, it's my first time using this, so I don't think I see any yet. Um, I'll go ahead and ask a question. Um, I work with graduate programs, and I was wondering if you could share any insight on how we can be more intentional on continuously trying to um, increase enrollment among diverse candidates. That is a great question. I'm glad you asked that. One of the big problems that we're having is by the time students get to university, they have no clue about any of the careers or any of the things that you all do. So we've got to find a way to reach out to junior high and high school students. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I prefer junior high. Elementary is great, but kids are still trying to just have fun at that time. Now, it's great to have the exposure. When you get to junior high, you start getting that pressure on what are you going to do after you get out of school? And you mm -hmm. start thinking about some of those things. So the more that they can get exposed to natural resources, to conservation, to the outdoors, outdoor activities, when they're in junior high and then leading into that high school uh, time frame. And in high school, we need to be creating some volunteer opportunities for them. So mm -hmm. you introduce them in junior high, they've had fun. And then when they get to high school, they can start helping other folks have fun. And then once they get to college, they're hooked. They know what they need to do. But one of the things I've found now, even in uh, the state of Texas, and we're starting to do a better job, we created programs that just cater to one group of folks. There's an organization, I won't name what it is, but in order to participate, and we're saying, we're calling this a uh, junior high and high school outreach, but in order to participate, you have to have X amount of family land. You have to be a member of 4-H as well as some other organization. You have to have shown animals or have some kind of uh, thing that you've done where you've displayed leaves and plants and all that kind of stuff in order to participate. But yet we say it's for everybody. Well, just those activities eliminated the majority of the folks that, that would have some kind of passion around the outdoors. So we've got to think about ways where we can go into these schools, go into these neighborhoods, introduce these young people, give them some experiences, not only give them experiences, but let their families know that this is an important career. Absolutely. And they can even find a way to help their parents yeah. enjoy it. Now, one of the other things that we started that is starting to work for us is we did something called Texas Outdoor Family. Uh, but what Outdoor Family does, it provides a way for a family that has never engaged in outdoors, never camped or anything before, to come to one of our state parks for $65 of family of four to six can come. We provide everything but food. We provide tents, we provide utensils. If you need to fish, we provide the, the, the rods and somebody is there to show them how to do it. Uh, we provide, again, everything but food is for the entire weekend. And we're starting to get some pretty good traction. Now we still have an issue for folks that are more day users. 
uh, and, and folks that that they may not have sixty five dollars to do that kind of activity. So we're starting to do something at local uh, lakes and ponds and all that kind of stuff and create some kind of activity just for the day. But it's about introducing folks and saying, this is for you. This is not just something that other people do. You can do this also. And even reminding folks of their heritage of doing it. We have a group of uh, folks that are Buffalo soldiers that actually help go out, help us go out and talk with different youth in different areas about uh, the history of bus Buffalo soldiers and how Buffalo soldiers actually started state parks. I mean, uh, uh, national parks. So those are the kind of things that we've got to keep doing. But we need university folks to go out and talk about these careers, uh, help them do some, some projects or, or get them to volunteer and do some hands-on stuff so they can see that this is something that's viable for them. And it's really great. And here's what, there's long-term benefits from doing this, not only for you, but also for your family. So, so the more we can get out and touch folks, and I, and I know it takes money to do that kind of stuff but i'm starting to find out there's some organizations that are willing to fund those types of activities we just need willing people to go out and do the work mm -hmm. great thank you it's very insightful um so unfortunately i think we're at time and we did have one other question from david knight but david i'll ask you and any others uh to use the app for those questions and thank you again. This has been a really amazing session and I am happy to have been a part of it. Thank you. And I'm glad you all asked. Hopefully yeah. next time I'm not at another conference.